Let's come to the liberal side of it. So who exactly are the liberals in India? Right? Uh, who exactly is committed to the proposition that what rights people have under the conception of common citizenship should be independent of what their collective religious identities are? Never been a part. In fact, the only one who was, I think, committed to that proposition seriously was Lala Rajshatra, actually, oddly enough. Okay. Nobody is committed. Who are the liberals that are commit that are skeptical of the use of state power in dissemination disseminating educational hegemony across the country? This vast apparatus of the university <coughs> system that, that both of us have plead from. Right? This is the background context in which the articulation of, the, of ideas takes place. Right? So this unholy alliance between the left and the Congress party, that no diversity in educational thinking should be allowed that we'll have millions of students subject to exactly that. I mean, Tagore could not get, could not, would not be able to set up Shanti Niketan under our current regulatory regime. Where are the liberals? Our, it's our liberal friends who sustain this regulatory regime. Uh, who is committed to the proposition? And, 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 and I think this is serious, one, which is when we think of conceptions of Indian nationalism, the standard account is you have a choice between two. You have the unitary one, Savarkar, whatever, or you have the composite one. Frankly, both are commit the same fallacy. They commit the same fallacy because right, both of them want to keep individuals tethered to some notion of collectivity. One just says, I mean, the joke is in the sense that Congress was Hindu nationalism and Muslim nationalism run together, and BJP simply loft off the Muslim nationalism part. Okay. Where is the idea? that part of what genuine religious discovery will require or part of what a genuine liberal society will require right, is, in a sense, to use the old-fashioned cliche word, liberating people from the constraints in the path of their self-awareness and self-discovery and providing the enabling conditions for that. My worry about Professor Nandi's invocation of, in a sense, you know, religious modes of toleration that are available that the secularists have bridge is that it, again, partakes of the same fallacy. It has already instrumentalized the religion. Objective, social peace. We can't get, in, get it through liberalism and a secular ideology. Let's get it through these sort of instrument, you know, these practices that are nice. Honest answer is we don't know what the logic of those practices are. In some cases, they'll turn out to be nice. In some cases, they'll not turn out to be intolerant, although not in the genocidal way that nation states are. There I, there I uh, actually agree with you. Uh, it's also decisionism about religion and, and the composite culture. That given that we want social peace, let us decide to believe in a composite culture. It's got the relationship between belief and identity completely backwards. Uh, you, you know, I think Locke was right on that. Belief in that sense is not a matter of will. I mean, if you know, it's quite possible that somebody genuinely believes uh, that. Hinduism is retrograde, somebody genuinely believes Islam is retrograde. You know, you can't have a kind of compulsory sense that, look, in the interest of this being a composite nation, you sort of we construct a common narrative. I mean, beliefs are, I mean, there's something false about that idea of inducing a belief that way. So that instrumentalization of conceptions of religious tradition, uh, is in some senses, I think, endemic even to the composite culture argument or, you know, to use the phrase in fashionable these is hybridity argument, right? Uh, simple fact is, we don't know where the logics are of, 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 of our beliefs take, it takes us, in, at least in their, in, their, in their own terms. And so the wisdom, therefore, consists in, and I think this is the practical political challenge, of trying to, in a sense, find political arrangements that allow us to live with very radical differences. Not just, not just differences between Hindus and Muslims, differences amongst Muslims, within, the, you know, all of, The reason I said there are no liberals in India is people invoke the proposition that power should not be imposed upon people if they're not consenting to it. I mean, that's the core normative idea. Let's follow that logic through. That should go all the way down to individuals. It cannot be, as it were, left at the level of uh, uh, community identities. So both 
religion and liberals are insane. <laughs> they're all takers in the sense that I don't find any people corresponding to what I would think are the two true, as it were, prescriptions, uh, the true descriptions, uh, uh, two reference points uh, that they should uh, uh, evoke. And the threat I would submit to both liberalism and religion in India is actually common. That's the threat Ashish Dha talked about, which is nationalism. Uh, which is, in a sense, both colonized discussions about value. The question of benchmarking identity has colonized the questions about rights. And the question of, in a sense, what our common history is, has, has basically colonized all questions of the transcendent and so forth. So I would submit to you that there are all liberals and, and religious people, whatever is, they actually have, as it were, a common enemy, which is the colonization of identity, or colonization of reason by identity. That is the central fact of India's political culture in so many different ways, whether it's on the religious question, whether it's on the caste question. And the question for us is how do we once again prize open the question of, if you like, of, of, of the relationship between reason and identity on one hand? Because only that will then create the political space to be actually able to talk about workable arrangements that are fair and just, that are unencumbered by the pressures of identity. The great Hindi critic, Hazari Prasad Dwedi, had this powerful sentence. I'll, I'll say the Hindi first because it is so evocative. He says, you know, whenever we are talking about religion in India, secularism, he says, Jab dil bhara aur dimaag khali ho, to shastro mein ruchi nahi rehti hai. So we have always come to this question with our hearts full and our minds empty, and hopefully at some point we can get some clarity. Thank you. Well, thank you.